what's going on welcome back to another episode of the wednesday behind the wheel podcast uh you know that thing we do kind of every week so i'm holding some headphones here which usually means that we have a guest which is true today as well so um we're going to kind of get right into it you know with all the tuning stuff that we've had conversations about with people in the industry um and there's so much to to speak about when it comes down to to tuning and to different platforms, and we've kind of gone the gauntlet of doing so. So today we're bringing in a, a, a company that I think a lot of people, especially in the Euro community, will be familiar with, um, Integrated Engineering. We have Tyler and Carter with us. What's going on, guys? Hey, thanks for having us on your show. We're excited to talk about uh, some of the cool stuff we do here. And we are excited to bring you the 12 listeners that we have. <laughs> <laughs> so... You know, I think I think what's interesting is, um, you know, we've done a few little projects together on a couple of cars. I think you guys have, have been doing, and uh, we love the opportunity to work with different automotive um, industry people because I think it gives us a lot of perspective. It also gives us a lot of feedback, um, not only to just the, the product side, but I think just to the different parts of the community because. People get this common conception that when you say Euro, that it's super like all inclusive. And a lot of times you'll find that these different companies, they have different niches of the segment. And it's and it's interesting to kind of see everybody's peripherals. You know what I mean? No, totally. Yeah. And uh, these are, you know, the people are just building a lot of different cars. They have different goals for it. Yeah. And there's ways you can go. So it's. Uh, I I had an I had an interesting time, you know, when we first got linked up with with you guys. I had an interesting time reading a little bit about the business and how it was family owned and kind of how it evolved and um and what was interesting and I think the part that struck a chord with me is that so and if I'm correct, when you guys started in 2007, it seemed to be a part time venture to about 2010 before that kind of business built up. Um, and what's interesting is I had done that when I first came out of college, I tried to do a part-time shop thing and really give it everything I had because I believed so much that I was going to be part of this industry that I was going to go build cars. And that's, you know, my life's hobby and my life's obsession. So I was so confident that was going to be what I would do every day. And about after 18 months of doing it, I had burnt out to the point of just wanting to take the gas pipe. So we're watching the other side of this where, you know, this company uh, obviously not only found the steam it needed, but was able to really transform into something pretty great. Yeah. Can you give me like give us a little bit more for people that don't really know the story? Uh, I've uh, I've been lucky to be with this company long enough uh, coming up on, my, you know, 15 years with them to really see all the different growth periods that we've gone through. But uh, Pete and Dave, you know, started selling some parts. They're our owners. Uh, they're also brothers. And uh, they started the company when they were in college. So Pete and Dave grew up. Uh, their dad was a big time Porsche race car driver. Pete raced an F2. They both did circuit racing. So cars had always been in their blood. And that's something that kind of resonates with a lot of employees here that work for them as we've all grown up as enthusiasts too. So it's, it's really a nice kind of family and shared interest area. Um, Pete was really big into cars. He bought his, you know, like first CNC machine in his garage and was do, you know building stuff for locals here. Uh, and then when they decided to go to school, he went into engineering and his brother Dave went into business so that they could build this company. And they were selling connecting rods uh, out of their dorm room before you know we moved into a small building. <laughs> That's uh, fantastic. Yeah, and we, you know, we're a little bit opposite of some of the other companies. We started out in the really hardcore parts side. Yeah. So connecting rods, camshafts, valve train, uh, building race engines. Our first dyno was actually an engine dyno and we were building like complete 1.8T, 20 valve stuff. You know, Mark IVs were a big deal then. Um, yeah, and we were we were building all that stuff. And then as we kind of merged into the Mark VI and Mark V world and even into Mark VII's, uh, those cars just were different. You know, you didn't need connecting rods to build over 300 horsepower anymore. A simple yeah. flash tube gets you there. So we wanted to take that same hardcore engineering and uh, bring it into the market and be a little bit you know, the opposite of how some other companies were doing stuff and, you know, really bring like that same level of engineering to not just software tuning, but intercoolers and intakes and charge pipe systems, anything that you would use at performance. We wanted to bring that same level of care that you would have to build a connecting rod or a piston or a yeah. camshaft 
to the market. So, I think it's an interesting position because when when you, you talk about it from that perspective, so I, I I've built a hand I've built this solid you know let's say I've built twenty or thirty engines over the course of my own you know playing with cars career if you call it right. So I always thought that, and I've also tuned a lot of standalones and stuff like that. So I have, you know, not recently. So, I, you know, my knowledge obviously has probably gone further out the window. But the idea of tuning and kind of how engines work doesn't, right? But I think what's interesting is that I think the more I got into actually building engines, it actually made me a better tuner because I really had a much better understanding about what things were doing and what caused them like what would the cause and effect were, right? Do you feel that coming from the hard parts that that actually was an advantage for some of the tunes maybe you guys provide? Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. can see this quite a bit more than I can actually, but uh, if you understand how an engine works, yeah, uh, that's exactly what will read you down the range of software. So, uh, you know, the way we got into software was it wasn't an overnight decision, but when we were building race engines, and those kind of things, uh, we had to tune them yeah. on the dyno to make sure that those parts were working. Right. Uh, but you know, Carter and I both are kind of mirror the same thing. Before we were working for IE, we were big. And any of the old Euro guys will know this, but you know, we were huge into like 120T 20 valve engines back in like the Mark IV day. And yeah. Actually, with Carter, before he worked for us, that's what got him into tuning. Was, that's where I started. Yeah, <laughs> it was with 18s, and same with me. You know, I met the brothers because I was buying uh, stroker parts from them. To build an Audi and <laughs> yeah. walk in the same day and never left. So no, listen, I, I get that. There's um, so I don't have a huge Euro extensive background as far as owning cars, but but I was super into tur anything turbo back in that period, right? So like a um, bunch of my friends had had you know GTIs and you know a couple of them had some really nice you know, like a three three seven and a twentieth and just the odd like ability to work on those cars was kind of different for me because I came more from the sport compact segment in the sense of, you know, like more of the DSMs and Eclipses and Evos that I just started to come out at that time. Um, so I think like going from those cars, it was kind of a different realm. One, because for the most part, the the GTIs that I was playing with at that point, the Mark IV stuff was newer. Um, two, because we realized that everything does require a special tool. Um, and I think the third part was that was really kind of, and I know we weren't there yet, but that was really in that infancy where you're starting to see those CAN bus type things happen where there was like, you know, these networks that you realize that some things played nice and some things just totally didn't. Right. Um, so it's an interesting, it's an interesting, it's an interesting part, but like, I love, those 1.8Ts, you know, I don't feel like we were able to make a lot of torque right off the bat with them um, as far as um, what we can get away with from a tuning perspective, but they did make power. Boy, did they make power. Oh, yeah. Uh, I think the 1.8T was really the big jumping off point for Volkswagens in the aftermarket world, you know, yeah. and that brings where we are today where uh, I think you'll probably see this too, but a lot of, you know, there was this kind of downturn where, a Subaru and Mitsubishi was soft making some of the cars that made Japanese cars so accessible and popular, you know, like uh, the Evo stopped being produced and you weren't yep. the kind of the end of an era in that case. And I think a lot of those uh, guys that grew up in the same time period we did that were really into Japanese cars jumped into Euros, right? Yeah. Mark sevens were getting, making really good power at that point. They were pretty new on the market and it was just a really easy jump from turbo four cylinder you know, Japanese cars into the Euro market. And that's where we saw a big explosion too. And that's when our company really uh, jumped into the big software tuning scene and, and took off. So, yeah, I think the Euro community really experienced a, almost like a, a interesting graduation, right? You had a lot of guys that I think came from, um, you know, a sport compact beginning Honda, even the NA stuff where there was no turbo, but, but they were super into that tuning model and then they had some money or a little bit more expendable income and they could go get something that had some features and some options and maybe a little bit of more um i don't want to insult anybody because i remember i came from sword so like anybody out there like don't fry me i'm not saying anything but 
there is there is a different way that some of the German stuff drives comparatively to some of the uh, you know more import stuff and it drives heavier it's more substantial i think a lot of people feel that when they're when they're driving those cars and um then you come out with the aftermarket support where you can easily make power on these cars and now i think you're into a different breed and uh, yeah we've we've seen we've seen a lot of the same things so i think it's in it's it was a good platform for people to grow into in a way yeah i can i agree with that entirely and you know, as the Japanese cars were kind of shying away from boost and the more sport compacts in the US world, uh, Volkswagen and Audi were going full head first into that stuff, right? right? So Audi, the B8 S4s with the supercharged uh, V6s in them were kind of the first, you know, really boost happy, larger engine displacement that Audi had put out on the market. And those got incredibly popular around that same time, too. So it was an easy jump to go from something like an Evo into. Uh, either like a GTI or Golf R, if you want to say all the driver into like the Audi S4s. Yeah. yeah. So now, when we start to think about like these cars making power, like you said, you've evolved into this tuning aspect. What What's mm-hmm. interesting for me, and again, I have slight bit of tuning background, so that's where I guess I come from a little bit, right? But like when we start talking about, you know, the idea, and I've always thought this was interesting, even in the early days, um, how they would flash tunes or, you know, do a lot of that stuff, whether it be the APR, the, you know, the Unitronic, the um, Absolute, different things like that, right? So now coming into this realm, you have more of a, you know, plug and play tune standard, which was very different from us because in, in the sport compact world, that really didn't exist, right? Like Cobb, Cobb access ports and things like that, that was, that was not, we weren't there yet, right? Um, and if we were, it was a much different scale, but, but so now you guys, you know, you still sell, even to this day, you still sell the ability to get a, let's say, I don't want to say stage tune. I think that's a a word I kind of don't love, but, but essentially these, these tunes that come in a, in a a little bit more generic shell and give them uh, estimated power gains, um, how does that happen? You know, I know how cars work when you tune them in real life. But, like, how does it happen that, you know, when you try to sit down and develop a tune that's going to work for a vehicle in different locations, across different climates and barometric pressures and, and altitudes, and uh, and I know there's a lot of, con- you know, um, tables and, and different, you know, um, compensation areas within an ECU, but, like, how do you start out by developing something and say, yep, this is going to be safe for all these cars? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions in the market these days. I mean, you kind of hit the nail on the head there that Volkswagen Audi has always been more of the brands that have had more off the shelf tunes is kind of the, the love term for that. Right. Sure, yeah. Tunes. But that was also a disadvantage to us. So we're located in Salt Lake City, which okay. is a higher education city. Most of our competitors are somewhere near sea level. Right. Or near Oklahoma stuff. So uh, for us, we, we've always wanted to be very honest forward. And what we were finding when we very first started tuning is our torque numbers were very hard to replicate by trying to use sea level uh, on the dyno just by corrections, right? And we don't want to give out false information. So what we first did was uh, say, well, what can we do to give out true honest horsepower based on uh, where we are located up here at elevation, but not make it look like we're making less power than our competitors because right. we're at elevation. Yeah. Send us down this realm of building what we call our sea level generator. Um, it's a really cool, cool piece of tech. This isn't something that's generalized in the industry at all. In fact, I don't know of any other competitor that does this. Okay. And what to originally be a disadvantage for us being at elevation has turned into a, a large advantage in my opinion. Because what we can do here is with our sea level generator, it's actually a pretty complicated but also a simple system. But it uses two large turbines that we run through a ported, basically a big ported system that has a computer controller on it. And it either bleeds pressure or allows it to build more pressure based on whatever elevation we want to recreate. And we port that directly to the car. So it's not adding boost to it. It's just bringing the pressure of the manifold up. So we can go anything from where we're located here, which is right around. 4,500 feet elevation down to sea level in, in-house. in uh, So we can get really, really far in a calibration process without even having to leave the dyno 
Um, and that's usually the first step. And wow. then there we go into what, you know, we take the cars and actually take them out to locations. We'll drive them to California. We'll drive them up to Colorado, wherever we need to test them, uh, down to Vegas for really hot stuff. Luckily here in Utah, we get all sorts of climates. So throughout yeah. the year, we can test all sorts of different scenarios in at our hometown. And then we always followed up with a large beta program. So before a tune hits the market, we put it on a lot of cars. So now, listen, did you guys build an in-house car hyperbaric chamber? Is that what, is that is that essentially what we did here? Yeah, I think you could well, probably put it that way. Um, for a an smaller thing. scale. Yeah. <laughs> smaller so basically scale. what it is is two compound tur like giant compound turbos they're big turbines that move a lot of air a lot more air than what we're shoving into the volume of the track that we run to the inlet so by pressurizing the turbo inlet or the air box or whatever we're able to hook it up to on that vehicle we're able to simulate all these different pressures it's really similar to what the oems do just on a smaller scale since we're not pressurizing the entire room wow that's that's crazy and I would imagine that there is a good advantage in that because there's a fair amount of population that still lives at, you know, above sea level type elevations. And to know that at least they're getting the safety part of that, right? Because that's always the, con that's, a, that's a concern when you build, I think, some of these tunes, right? Is that even if, let's say, I, you know, I'm on the East Coast, so like I'm, we're down near the water. So, um you know, the ability to have a cartoon like that. But then if you travel to a different raceway, let's say you end up, you know, racing in Denver or, you know, whatever it may be, the elevation change, obviously you have to go there with the intention of that. You're going to, you're going to do some data logging and, and, and testing and you're going to kind of dial this tune back in, but you guys have that part. And now you've created a, a kind of a, an ability to be able to set, you know, kind of simulate the, the part, the other part. Yeah, that's exactly. We had two major goals when we designed this. Uh, first one was data, right? So that we can basically build a tune that's going to work everywhere and know that, and we can mm -hmm. get the majority of that work done here in house. Yeah, and that data to back up those findings. And then uh, the second one of that was just honesty. So when we put out performance numbers, we're not relying on dyno corrections. Yeah, which are dyno corrections are an amazing tool when you're when you're testing something that's already made, right? So if you're taking your car to a dyno shop to have it dynoed and you're going from stock to tuned on that same car in that same condition in that same area, it gives you a really good idea of what kind of power you're making. And then that dyno can, you know, the person operating a dyno can put a correction factor on it if you're not at sea level or whatever. And you have a really good idea of what your car is making right. at sea level. Right, right, right. On an engineering basis, that's not a that's not something that's helpful because that's not data that's telling us exactly what's happening. Right. And it wouldn't be fair for us to give that to a customer either to dyno a car up here and sea level put corrections on it and be like hey this is the power you're going to see at sea level and what that allows us to do is put the actual numbers as it's making in those conditions out on the the website so yeah that's that's an it's it's interesting it's like you know if, but you know and that's the thing i think that the um the old um you know, do the old command, whatever on the keyboard, uh, was a different tool that people used to use to make their, uh, tuning look a little bit better. I'm not talking about tuning companies. It was mostly individual tuners that I could think yeah. of. Right. Um, and you know, certain shops got a number, but like the, the problem is when you really get into tuning cars, right. You realize that you're never tuning to a number. You're always tuning the car to kind of what it wants to be at and then you stop. Right. Um, and that, and I think that that's, that's one of those hard parts, right? Like you said, like, you know, w w it's not about simulating just the number, but with a sales tool, right, you guys have, people have an expectation when they go out there and they buy these tunes and they want to know what that's going to be. Right. They think there's this black science and magic in some of these things. That's going to just magically make your car way more powerful then, then maybe it could be so they shop with these numbers and you guys have to sell that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. It, it would be, I mean, well, it, in pure honesty here, it would be a major detriment if we didn't do that. If we yeah. put a correction number on there or better, yeah, we wouldn't ever do that. So if we didn't put a correction number on there and just put out horsepower numbers based on where we're located at Salt Lake City here at Elevation, those numbers are going to be much lower than uh, any other competitor who also dynos their stuff in at sea level. Right. And it's not a comparison. And it would be, you know, it, it's not re realistic for us to 
expect every customer to educate themselves on how a dyno works before they go shopping for a performance tune. Yeah. No. So Carter, this may be more of your question, but like when we start talking about the idea of computers have so many different compensation tables, right? We know for a fact that the that the ECUs will will adjust to a lot of different parameters, usually in more in the safe the sake of safety or whatever it may be. But like when you do when you do a tune, uh, you know, up there and you put it into some of these cars, is is there a level of that tune that will make more power at sea level just because of the fact the car will will do the things it's supposed to do anyway? Well. The biggest thing about that is we we are able to test every elevation in house with right. our C generator, but that's about eighty percent of the development pro process. The rest of it is going to these locations and actually doing the testing. We're logging every variable for fueling, for knock, for timing advance, for boost control. All of this stuff is logged between negative DA at sea level all the way up to high heat at eight thousand feet. Right. So no matter where you're at, we have at least tried to hit those weather conditions, those temperature conditions, those ambient conditions, wherever you're at, we have done the logging and done the testing. And it will, of course, especially with a drag racing background, you know, if you're racing in Denver, yeah. you're going to run two seconds slower than if you're running at sea level minimum. Yeah. There is a big power difference. It's just what the compressor can move at those high elevations where the air density is so much lower. You're just never going to make the same power. Yeah. Operate at the same pressure ratio at sea level it's going to make more boost. It's going to use more fuel. Our job is to make sure that it doesn't exceed the fuel system's capacity or that any other parameter that we're monitoring is not exceeded based on the conditions the car is in. Yeah, and I think you can maybe talk a little bit too uh, about the the tables that are involved on that because here's the you kind of brought up that you know you're you were kind of used to tuning maybe some standalone stuff or mm -hmm. even some sure. Japanese ECUs, but these German ECUs are much more complicated. Mm -hmm. Um, they have inverse tables and uh, make, like some of the S4 stuff we've done, the B9 S4 tables, is, it's got some really complicated stuff in there. Yeah, so a good example of that is just to show the complexity of these ECUs, there are over 140,000 defined maps in the B9 S4 calibration. Oh, that's 140,000, most of that is there to get them just in the factory tune, the factory calibration. They're designed to drive the same no matter where you drive it. So all of these compensation tables, all of this calibration data, it's all looking at ambient pressure. It's looking at temperature, ambient temperature and charge temperature. And it's it's doing all of the compensation that you're talking about yeah. already. And it, not to say we don't tune that because we push it further than the factory calibration does. But right. all of that stuff, all of that complexity exists in the ECU and they're all tools for us to be able to go anywhere and make it drive the way that we want. Yeah. And I think like there's, there's a, from, from the techie nerd side of me, there's a bunch of questions that I would want to ask, but I don't, I think that's too, that's too deep in the weeds for today's podcast. But, but I think an interesting part is so what are some of the cars? I mean, you mentioned one, but what are some of the other Volkswagen Audi cars that you guys have, have tried to develop some tunes on or whatever it is that you were like, man, this car, this one's a real son of a bitch. <laughs> That's a really good question. I think the best answer to that that I have is probably the C8 RS7. It's the second gen 4.0 T V8, and it's an awesome engine. It's got pretty big turbos for an OEM. We made 700 horsepower stock just wow. a few. Wow. And that's these, no hardware. That's just tuning. That's just tuning. They're, the problem with that is the turbos are very twitchy. It took me almost two months to get the boost control dialed in for all of the different conditions that we tested. They don't, there's no longer a boost control table that looks at pedal position by RPM okay. or boost pressure by RPM and then spits out a wastegate duty cycle. There's a very complicated thermodynamic model that calculates where the wastegate should be. And tuning that model with a hundred different inputs that rely on all of these environmental factors it took a very long time on that platform just because those turbos, the size of the turbos and the size of the engine and the complexity of the model, it was just very twitchy. There was a six, seven PSI difference within a couple duty cycle on the wastegates in the mid range. And it just, it took a very long time to get it perfect. Jeez. They, we have guys in like 
not even just the RS6 and RS7, but in like the RSQ uh, SUVs that are like running. Like well, they're running tens of ten seconds, ten eights on street tires and like 20, 22 inch wheels. Yeah, in an SUV, like that is an incredibly impressive engine. Five thousand so. plus thousand pound <laughs> cars. Yeah. yeah, that's that's awesome. Like I would, it's hard because like I'm right into that thing where. You know, look, I'm 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 just old enough. Nobody on the podcast could really care about this, but I don't care anyway. Uh, so I'm just old enough where I have, you know, I have two kids, and uh, you know, what I get to drive every day is not my most impressive factor, right? Like, you know, I so I have a Volkswagen Atlas that I actually use every day because I could throw a whole bunch of people and dead bodies in there, and then I can also like transport the kids back and forth. Um, but, but the, you know, and, and I think it does everything right, but you know, like not whatever. So now I'm like looking to change that car and, you know, I mean, what do I want? I want an X5M, right? Like I want, you know, an R, RSQ7, uh, you know what I mean? I want some of these other things so I could stay in that same size, but have, you know, the, the, the monster meets to come with it. But, um, I think that's where a lot of the industry is going to. I think you'll we'll see that a lot. I mean, some of our most some of our most selling platforms are SUVs at this right now. I mean, like the B9 SQ5s, huge platform, huge platform. People yeah. love those. They make great power with very little very little things. And honestly, I mean, drag running a 10 second quarter mile or whatever is super cool. What it's great that you can do that on flash. <laughs> that's yeah. not where most of our customers live. I mean, yeah. and that's not where we're putting most of our innovations these days. Most people are exactly what you just said. Um, yeah. That resonates with all of us, I think. I mean, you know, I've started out building cars that were undrivable on the street and thinking that was super Every cool. Everyone work. You know, I'm not that age anymore. I got a kid and my wife has to drive it. And, she has to go pass emissions and stuff, right? So like, yeah, you know, and that's where most of our customers I think are these days where people are, they want a car that they can drive to work, they can pick up the kids, they can go get groceries in, they can share with their wife, but it's exactly what you said. You want to still, in, you know, that time period between when you are going from home to work or from work to home and you, you've got to take care of everything that happened to your day. That's the time that you ask, you know, people want to enjoy their drive the most and yeah. not on a racetrack or not on a drag strip they're driving around and that's where, you know, that could be your release from the day. That's where people want to have fun with their car. And that's where we're really focusing our energy to make sure that tuning your car isn't just, you know, pulling out a laptop and having to email people to get your files back and forth yeah. anymore. You want it to exist in your day-to-day -day life in an easy way. And that's where we put a lot of our energy into bringing product that does that. So, you know, like our mobile platform, you don't need to even own a, a laptop anymore. You don't have to have cables in your uh, secondary device that you have to carry around. You don't have to plug in. It's a little tiny OB2 device, OB2 device that you plug into your port, and it just lives there, and it wirelessly, wirelessly connects to your Android or Apple phone, and you can watch like live gauge data as you're driving. You can see what your car is doing. It's kind of fun to have a, an actual boost gauge there. You're not putting in you know, pods or anything to read this stuff or act, extra sensors. It's all just being pulled wirelessly straight to your phone. You can flash your tune, upgrade your tune, contact our support department if you ever needed anything, uh, make data logs all right from your phone. And that's a really simple way to exist. And while we're, we're the very first people to ever bring mobile flashing to the Volkswagen Audi platform per se, we're definitely the first OTS platform that brought it in such a wide range. Right. Uh, yeah. That's the beginning of it too. That's where we're really focusing that energy. Yeah, no, it makes sense. I mean, like, let's be honest. If, let's say you know, you can go look up your web sets and I'm sure that 80% roughly of people that are coming to your website are coming there from a mobile device. It's not, it's not unlike you would be able to be like, all right, well then when they go to plug into their car, they're going to want to then all of a sudden pull out their laptop. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, that makes sense. Let me ask you a question from, from maybe the, some of this stuff. And again, if you, if you guys don't want to go here, I understand. I, I listen, here's, uh, let me just say this because, you know, from a personal level, maybe we don't know each other, but like, here's the thing. M I have been very, very <clears throat> hard on the outspokenness of what the EPA is doing from an agenda standpoint, especially when it comes to electric vehicles. Now, I think people get them come misconception that I'm against electric vehicles, which is not the truth at all. I think that electric vehicles are cool for what they are. 
I think that there's a place for them within the market space. I just don't think that they're in the entire market space. I don't think it makes sense. I don't think it serves any purpose that is actually beneficial when you start to really work all the numbers and extend the roots out down the down the track there. Now, um, am I a little bit bitter maybe because I, I love cars and I love what an internal combustion engine is for? Sure. I think that hydrogen is is a potential other pathway that we can get there. I think there's a lot of other platforms and, and other ways that I think even Toyota as an OE has been extremely verbose about, about saying we can get there through these hybrid systems that exist, right? So there's a lot of things like that. But the reason I'm kind of going into that nature is that when we start talking about the EPA, I've been tough on them in what they're doing because I think it's a blind agenda, not because I, I think from an energy or from an environmental standpoint that we can't get to where they need to be or that we shouldn't try to get there, right? So let's separate out the two. But now you're selling tunes that are going to go out to everybody, potentially all over the world, right? And 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 let's say within the U.S. anyway, you know, you have certain states, whether it be California Carb and stuff like that. How do you develop a tune that's going to be able to be used by these people? Do you shy away from certain states? Do you do you try to develop something that you know is going to be passed? Do you like how, how does it all work? Yeah, I mean, there's that is. It would be ridiculous for any company to be ignoring it at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you're going to hear similar answers from all the large tuners, all the large aftermarkets. And uh, if any of them are ignoring it, it's going to be a really bad day mm -hmm. coming in, right? So one of the first things uh, to bring on this is like, it's not really tuning that's the problem right. at this point. Uh, the, the problem is going to be exhaust. It's going to be not even just exhaust, but replacing the catalytic converters. Um, that's where the EPA is hitting it. That's where people are not going to be able to pass emissions. Mm -hmm. That's where people are getting in trouble for deleting stuff. Uh, most like if you're most of our software is not none of our software is turning off check engine lights or messing with right. uh, trying to trick the EPA or anything. I mean, that's a one way ticket to getting your company shut down these days. Uh, but where we are trying to do stuff, and I think this is where there's a disconnect between companies and EPA is the EPA is, is screaming compliance, 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 and companies are like, okay, let's do it. We'll be compliant. But they don't really have any systems set up for us. They're yeah. all set up for OE, right? Yep. So we've gone down the path of like buying cars, putting product on it, shipping it to California, and sending it to EPA, and then having them do the test work. And then we get our EPA compliance stickers. And this stuff is incredibly expensive. It takes a very long time. Yeah. And there's really no system set up for it. So what we're doing now is uh, just what some other companies are also doing. We're not inventing this, but it's showing that things are compliant on our own table. So uh, right now we're having uh, an emissions dyno put in. It's actually being installed right now here at our shop. So we'll be doing emissions testing on all of our products here in-house so that we can send that paperwork to them instead of trying to ship cars and letting them sit on them for two years. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and those are the those are the kind of innovations and the investments that companies are going to have to make. Yeah. So right now, uh, like if, if you're on a stage one tune, you know you can. There's no catalytic converter problem with that. Right. Um, and honestly, the I think Volkswagen and Audi and all these other automakers are also. I don't know if they're doing this to favor us or not, but we're actually seeing less and less of these new cars have issues with catalytic converters holding back power. I don't know if it's just good timing. I think what it probably is, is the advancements in turbo technology. So a lot of turbos coming on vehicles now are better than they were even three, two, five years ago. So yeah. they're smaller, but they're making more power. Their center sections are lighter. The wheels are, are better made. So you can get more power out of a smaller turbo and there's less exhaust restrictions on it. Yeah. The thing so that's we, always, the thing that's always, I think always gotten me is that like, and, and I've, you know, for people that watch, I guess, um, you know, routinely, yeah, they've heard me uh, talk crap about this stuff over and over again. But like, the the thing is, I I believe that the majority of car people are not opposed to an environmentally friendly task. Like, I'm sure from you guys' perspective, that's not even the remotely part that bothers you with anything that that's going on, right? Like, that's that part we're totally good with. Like everybody is okay with being kind to the planet. And I think the more you understand tuning and the more you understand being vehicles, the more uh, uh, building vehicles, 
the more you understand that that really doesn't have any, you can still make a, pa a car with substantial power and follow all the EPA kind of guidelines that the OEs follow to make a vehicle have good emission standards or along the same playing field. The issue is that one, no one's publicizing what these, what these things should be, right? They're not saying, this is the checklist to how you make sure that you can make a vehicle with more power. And also here's the compliance that you need to be, uh, you know, and, and so when we start to talk about local tuners, there's nothing there, but like, you know, is there a pathway where this stuff all becomes, you know, able, could, could there be an EBA certification that this industry, you know, can obtain where a tuner can go and let's say buy, you know, spend the money to take one of these things and become knowledgeable in what these compliance measures are and become an EPA, you know, kind of certified tuner to the point where the industry can live on. There is a tremendous amount of vehicles. Like, I don't care what you say, like today's technology with some of these ECUs and the tuning capability that you have, if you take cars that were made 25 years ago that have now have carbon buildup on pistons and a whole bunch of different things, I don't care what you say, you can make a car more efficient than it was then with today's technology. You just can. Um, limitations, maybe within engines and, and, and timing tables and maybe some of the valve timing and variable timings that you have, but like... That's not that I don't think that that's a, a beef with any single one of us. And, and just like you said, like sometimes it's a pay to play situation. You guys have spent a lot of money investing in tools and and kind of the know with how to make sure that when you turn a vehicle out, when you turn a tune out, it's better than it was before in all aspects, whether it be performance or from an emission standpoint. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. And I think you're I think you're on the right track saying the answer is yes there is to a point a way to get certifications I mean you you go look at a lot of com products like you can go buy one of our mark 7 intakes that comes with a EPA approval number on it right it's a sticker you can put in your engine bay and it says hey this is EPA approved and you can go get your emissions done in California and they're going to see the sticker and they can pull that number up and it shows that we did our steps to get that approved so yes that does exist out there is it easy no no like, uh, I don't, it, it is kind of sad, but it, right as it sits right now, like if I were to go start a brand new company and I wanted to start making aftermarket parts, I don't think it would be super, it wouldn't be affordable to go straight to the EPA, the EPA to do this today. Right. And I would really love to see the government make the changes for companies to become compliant because it's a little hard for them to scream, be compliant, be compliant, be compliant, but then not right. give it so hard, a really clear avenue to do so. Yeah. Yeah. But there's avenues to do it and it does exist. The only thing, that's you're not going to probably ever see is like cat backs and down pipes or oh, down pipes really. So if there's, if there are, you know, there are companies building some really high end uh, catalytic converters that are high flow that are using precious metals instead of cell count to lower that emissions. They're putting out the same as stock emissions, but if that vehicle is within the factory uh, government backed emissions warranty, it doesn't matter. Right. It will not even accept an application for it. Yeah. So if your vehicle is within the factory thing, the only catalytic converter that will ever be stock is the stock one or ever yeah. be legal stock. Right. So there's zero avenue there. But yeah. other than that, pretty much every other product, yeah, like intercoolers, you can get those EPA certified. Intakes, you can get those EPA certified. Uh, software tunes, you can get those EPA certified. Yeah. There are avenues to do it, absolutely. And companies need to be looking at it and i think most are at this point so yeah i mean and that's and that's like and that's that's the thing like you know like right now the legislation is written in that you cannot touch or modify any part of a car vehicle's emission system period so there's there comes your uh, your limitations and like you said there's a pathway and everything else and i and look i would say for the majority of people that are out there that's not the majority complaint the the complaint is that the pathway to be able to properly do these things isn't clear it's not really laid out you know like you have some general guidelines but you're not really sure and i think it puts people in you know like you know and i think about like a lot of just even the smaller tuning shops right because from their perspective you know they're taking a lot of heat for doing the right thing for example you come in there to dyno your car you just want to dyno your car not going to tune your car 
I'm just going to dyno your car. I want to see how much power you make. These shops have to basically say to you now, do you have a catalytic converter on your car? And if you don't, they got to say, look, we got to, we can't have you here. <laughs> like we, we can't, we won't even risk it here because we're going to get, you know, hit with something, even though it's not necessarily fair, but you know, there, we got to be able to do a better job to be able to make sure that we can still have this, this industry. I mean, not even just from the financial aspect of it. The fact that like there's too many people that deserve to continue doing this as a hobby or as, you know, a way of life. Yeah. Well, I mean, you have to, the aftermarket industry is huge and it's, you know, it, there's a lot of money in it that, that people are obviously love their cars and they're spending yep. money on it and it expands so many different apps. <clears throat> I mean, everything from guys who like to build street trucks to guys who are professionally racing on the road. Right. So like road racing uh, and track racing and stuff. So I mean, and everything in between and there's guys that like low cars or guys that like fast cars. There's guys that like, that, you know, there's, and then there's guys like you and I that just want a fast car to drive to work every day yeah. or have fun in it. And there's, it's not going away. I mean, people have been modifying cars since the first one, yep. right? <laughs> since the, the model P or whatever, people have been modifying them ever since. So it's, it's, deeply ingrained in the car culture and i it's just going to be it's a it's this is where we're going to have to find that medium path right yeah. car enthusiasts are going to have to stop being restrictive to epa and and try to find that middle ground and epa is going to have to stop hammering on these guys and, and also find the, the middle ground yeah and i think that's going to happen just through both parties showing that they're open to help the other find that middle ground right yeah is that that makes some sense. And I think there's been some, you have to give SEMA a big hand on that one. I mean, they, they've, they hired the lawyers, they've gone to battle, you know, they've, they've really tried to pave the way. And the only way that I think a lot of these companies have been able to navigate the waters of getting EPA approvals have been through specialists that are working with SEMA that you can hire to, to do that. So, yeah, it's, yeah, a, yeah it's, it's, it's a tough, it's a tough thing, but I, listen, I think I took us too far down the rabbit hole. I get, I get a little emotional when it comes to this stuff. Um, from getting back to maybe some of the things you guys do. So I, we've obviously we've seen over the years the progression that we've made from hard parts to to software. And uh, and we I kind of you know you hit the site, you see there's some some cool things happening in some hard parts that are that are there. But like what else the big vision for for your company, anything that you can say as far as. You know, where do you think you're going? It's does it do you stay purely within, you know, uh, maybe Volkswagen Audi stuff? Do we grow? Are we are we expanding into some other things? That's an awesome question. Um, so our big, the big advance we see on the IE company is really we're pushing forward with becoming the company that wants to be at the forefront of technology and innovation. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're trying to push really hard to be an engineering first company that puts out innovation that people are going to love to really, you know, revolutionize what the modern enthusiast is. Uh, that has nothing to do with, you know, emissions or anything of like that. That's all just kind of a driving force behind the scenes that's pushing us into different areas of building the emissions dyno and stuff. But at the end of the day, we want your experience with your car to be as clean as it is with your phone or any other technology you're buying in 2024. Not feel like we're going back to the days of, you know, laptop tuning with cables everywhere. Yeah, well, that's a big thing about our industry as a whole is it's always 10, 20 years behind everything else. We carry supercomputers in our pocket and we still have tools from 2004 to flash our new Audi. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Which you know, revolutionized the way that that's all done to bring that up to date with everything else in our lives, everything else that we use. We want this to be as clean and easy to use as your laptop or your phone or any of the equipment that you're working with anything that's not just software easy. that's hardware too so we want our hardware to follow that exact same level yeah. of care and behind the thing and one of my favorite quotes our owner said years and years ago that's always resonated with me it's probably why i've stayed here for so long as he said i i don't want to make anything if i can't make it better and i think our whole company you know even our our accountants who aren't making products they don't do anything if they can't make it better so that's an underlying push for us is you know, to, to always be at the forefront of innovation. And sometimes when you're at the forefront of innovation, you know, you're when you're inventing things and not just recreating stuff that already exists, there's just learning curves there. And I think we've done everything we can to make sure that the customer is always uh, who we want to take care of first. 
And uh, as far as what future that looks like is, yeah, we're just going to keep pushing that thing. We have a really big internal goal here of, you know, modifying uh, a whole lot of a whole lot of cars and, and getting people really loving their cars. Right. But it, we're also introducing a new brand um, here this month, actually. So nice. We're you know we're located in Utah, and, and Utah is known for a really vast amount of opportunities. And we, uh, you know, we've all grown up here loving cars and modifying cars. But a bunch of us have also gone down the route of, you know, uh, enjoying other parts. So like some of us have trucks that we pull our cars to racetracks with, or we yeah. have trucks that you know we go camping in or overlanding in or whatever. So that's huge here in Utah, and, and it's you probably see the truck scene has just grown immensely throughout. Yeah. Uh, there so we wanted to bring the same kind of stuff we've been really kicking ass at in ie for you know decade uh, and offer that to another market so we have another brand called exodus that's a sister brand to ie and that is launching uh mid-april this month and we're bringing ford eco boost truck tuning to the market and shortly followed by hardware so that's we're really great. excited about that um, we partnered with some pretty cool stuff we built the truck if you go look at drive exodus on instagram you can see some of the stuff we're doing and we're bringing that same mobile tuning, that same stuff to the to Ford EcoBoost line. And that's a really fun market to enter because it does kind of feel like that market, even worse than Volkswagen Audi, is stuck in a pretty old place. Um, so bringing mobile tuning and, and some of that modern enthusiast touch to Ford is going to be a, a huge jump for that market. And I hope they're excited to see it. Yeah, I think it's interesting too because it's like when you really start thinking about it, first off, I think there's a lot of mirror mirroring that happens between our two companies, right? Like the first thing is like, especially over the last probably eight, nine, 10 years, we really spent a lot of time um, kind of in our engineering and, and I, you know, and, and we get better and better. And I think with every design, it's not just about making the wheels look different or, you know, have a, a different look to them or a different width or a different application. I think a lot of it is that you know, we're looking for different radiuses. We're looking for different strength points. We're looking for different, you know, processes within, uh, you know, kind of a lot of the tooling and stuff that we have to see, you know, kind of what we, what can we get out that's a little bit different. And, you know, and that's, you know, people say, how long does it take to make a wheel? Well, it may only take, you know, a few months to get the design down, but then we spend months and months and months and months, you know, just re, you know, playing with things, FEAing and things, coming back, you know, playing with it again, and 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 you know, you'd be surprised how much you can get a wheel to do when you start removing things you don't need and putting in things you do need, and coming up with other things that seem to hold more strength and rigidity. Um, so I think there's a lot of mirroring there, but also we had for years we had, you know, we've done some off-road truck stuff. Um, we have our own line there, but like we also. With Koenig, we kept getting the ask from a lot of people, like whether it be Forerunners or some of the Toyota stuff, or you know, and it was like it was like we want like more of a like you know performance oriented type stuff. So we came out this year with a with a with a truck line that kind of eh, truck line a series, um, <laughs> and so we started to push into that, but like. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, EcoBoost motors. I mean, now all the now a lot of the new um, uh, Tundras and stuff. They have that that twin turbo V six. I think. Um, I think it's even to the Tacoma, some of the Tacomas. I think. But like you, you have some of these vehicle platforms. I mean, hell, even the the new Atlas. They put that two point turbo in. Now you have a lot of trucks now that have these turbo applications that really allow them to be woken up without too much effort. Yeah, uh, it's just going back to like when we were all watching the very first Fast and Furious movie and just wishing that the turbo cars were everywhere and now they actually yeah, are. Right. So, yeah, <laughs> everything comes with that. You got to kind of give it to Ford too. Um, I think Ford was one of the first companies to really like push a smaller displacement but turbocharged engine into trucks. Yeah, that was pretty brave of them because you know a lot of people are like, oh, V8 is what you need or diesel is what you need to tow and stuff. Yeah. So. It was a tough sell, and it and it took off, and now you see Toyota kind of following that trend, which is probably gonna be pretty popular. And yeah. I can tell you, man, it is really cool to put a software tune on one of these three point five EcoBoosts, and they are super fun. So we've been filming some commercials and stuff for it in my in the marketing department, which is where I work here at IE, and uh, I've had a blast driving it. I've had a lot of the same like torque and boost fills from driving fast Volkswagen and Audis forever, and it's a really exciting market to get into, and something a little bit different. Yeah, we're it's, gonna bring some super cool stuff to those guys. Like, they should be really. Excited. 
Yeah, that's 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 awesome. I mean, the only thing I I disagree with you on with the Ford stuff is just that I wish the aluminum body still struggles with me a little bit. <laughs> like, you know, I you mean, know guys, yeah, maybe titanium would have been a better route. But I mean, I'm with you. You know, I yeah, I don't know. I mean, but I think yeah, the EcoBoost stuff is 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 certainly something that's out there that's been pretty cool, and it's fun kind of watching companies that are pushing into some other segments so that they can kind of one take their base with them right there's no doubt that you're experiencing something that we're seeing as well which is so we talked about that maybe a graduation that came from some of the sport compact segments into volkswagen audis and then you know i think you've had some people that have obviously went to bmw as well but then you're also watching a lot of these guys that as they get a little older they're in that same truck type thing so what are they doing they're they're buying Tacomas, they're buying, you know, Forerunners, Sequoias, they're buying, you know, they're buying some of these, uh, some of these trucks, like you said, I mean, Fords, I mean, listen, pickup trucks are not what pickup trucks once were. <laughs> I mean, they start at like $65,000 and they have more seating than some of the cars. So, um, it's pretty wild. Yeah. Like, uh, man, these things are so, they're, they're roomy and stuff, you know, they're, it's amazing how fast a 6,000 pound truck can be get up and go. I mean, uh, I was driving one with, uh, this morning and it was just like the, this, you know, you're doing over 80 off of a on-ramp on the highway with just the flash tune. So, I mean, they're, they're really fun to drive and, uh, they're not going to take a corner like a, <laughs> like, <laughs> right. Well, you know, I mean, all right, you gotta, there's gotta be a little bit level of compromise. Um, we don't recommend that you take corners high speed with something so tall, but yeah, for <laughs> sure. Oh but man. They do, they do strike a lot of that same, you know, in the belly torque feel, which is, I think what gets a lot of people into, into tuning their cars and stuff. In the first place is when you yeah. first test it, you get that like little boost fill in your chest and then like an addict, it starts to kind of lessen and then you need more. So has yeah, there, you can get that same fill from a pickup truck now. Is there anything else before we wrap up that you guys want to tell maybe some of the people that are now just becoming familiar with your with your brand maybe uh you know people that are familiar with your brand maybe have even owned your products but now are seeing you from this side of the coin like is there anything else about you know ie that you think like hey like love for people to know this yeah um Really, just thank you to all of our customers. I mean, we've had, we wouldn't be where we are today and grown at that speed if we didn't have people that were dedicated. And one thing about this, I really learned about this, uh, our customers, and it's more than just our customers, it's a community. It's just how loyal and how much they love this this yeah. world. And they get, the way that they've loved their car and the way they love this modification scene and just the amount of energy they put into really backing our company and being involved with our company and uh you know people are just so tied to it it's just it shocks me all the time and our customers are amazing and just keep your eye out because we're not slowing down at all in fact uh you know we really focus on just pushing and be bringing really cool stuff to the market that hasn't been seen before uh just gonna stay on top of innovating we've expanded all of our departments to just keep the speed up and uh we're really touching on what everyone's been asking for and that's just making cars more fun and at the end of the day that's what it's all about uh, i think it's really easy to get kind of stuck on this who's making the most peak power who's making the most you know who, who's running the fastest quarter miles and most people aren't that's not that's just a losing game always because there's always somebody faster there's always a better day than this that's going to run a better time so really where most people live in their cars is how does that car treat you day to day how does it feel when you drive to work how does it feel when you want to go have a spirit to drive up the canyon or down to the beach or something? Um, yeah. And we touch so many areas. We don't leave any stone unturned when we develop these products, whether it's software, hardware. It's not, you know, we're, we don't want to be the company that's just selling you on the high point and walking away as soon as you buy it. Yeah. Um, we have a lot of really cool innovation. You know, the app is just the, you know, right now we released, it's been a little over a year since we released our, our tuning app. And uh, you can flash your car with it. You can change octanes. You can log. We have a live uh, gauge screen on it. I mean, that stuff is all just tip of the funnel for what we have planned for that. Uh, we have some stuff I can't really tease right now, but we have some really, really cool things that's just taking all that to the next level using just, you know, 
what that unlocked for us as far as wireless mobile data and stuff. So keep your eyes open for some of those things. And um, I hope what we really, in your eyes, follow through on that promise that we want to be the forefront leader of innovation. And we can't do that without our customers, you know, helping us along the way. So yeah, no, listen, can, I think that's, I think that's great. I, not only do I appreciate that, I think like one of the biggest things for us and, and for me is that like, you could sell, listen, I mean, don't get me wrong. Part of being in business is selling things, right? Like you don't sell enough tunes. We don't sell enough wheels. Like we can't keep doing this whole thing. But <clears throat> there is this there is this level that like for the most part, we get more of our jollies off of making something cool and new. I mean, when we make, when we make new wheels and we start looking at designs and stuff like that, it ends up turning into... The, the most heated debate you've ever seen, right? People come in, there's, you know, it's on the TV. We're looking at stuff and it's like, damn it. Like, why'd you do this? You should have put it like this. And next thing you guys, what do you mean? That's awesome. Like, you know, like, and so there's a lot of, you know, that pride that, you know, we have about putting out products that we know, like what, like we would, we want to go buy. Right. So I totally get that. That's like, that's, I think that's what drives the good companies in our industry. And I think it's the one it's the, that is one of the driving pieces, if not the driving piece that separates the companies that have a longevity within this industry from some of the other ones, the people that are here to just try to get your money. It's just a business to them. I don't think that they'll ever super be able to last the test of time. Cause this industry is not the industry where you get like crazy rich. <laughs> it's, um, it's a fun industry. It's an industry that, you know, for, you know, almost 20 years that every day I come to work, I'm super happy that I'm doing this and not selling paper. Right. But, um, you know, look, you got it. You got to really love this stuff. And if you're not in one of those companies that loves this stuff, it becomes pretty apparent pretty quickly. Yeah. I think you'll recognize it too. I mean, selling wheels, is probably really similar to selling software. I don't think there's two products that people have so much passion about yeah. and how fast their car goes or how their car looks. There's such a first step on what, I mean, what are the two, what are the first two things most people buy for cars? It's like wheels and soft tune, right? Yeah. And the other aftermarkets and they're, the people that love these things are absolutely, you know, passionate about both of those. So you're going to get as many opinions about both of those products as anything. And <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't think anyone's going to work just to wrap it all up in a nice little bow. I don't think anyone works in this industry unless you love it because yeah, uh, there is a lot to, to go. Through. And, you know, because people, as many people love our brand, they also love our competitors just as much. Yeah. And if it wasn't for that, that kind of involvement that they have in it, it's what drives us all forward. You know? Yeah, so It really does move all of us to be better. And, and you have to be, you have to be at the forefront of bringing cool stuff to the market because if you get comfortable, it's, you're just, you know, you're, everyone else is going to find something better. So, yeah, no, I agree. And I think you summed it up pretty well. Listen, I appreciate you guys, you know, Carter, Tyler, I, it means a lot that we have other companies that are willing to come on to this thing. Um, you know, the podcast isn't something that we have ever really done for the sake of like, you know, trying to put out there for this big look, like, you know, universal marketing thing, because most of the time we don't even talk about wheels. Like it's really just a matter of being able to do cool things with the relationships we have. And, um, and it's fun to be able to have guys, uh, especially people that are, you know, kind of like car enthusiasts, uh, similar to us, uh, come on, share their point of view and, and all that good stuff. So thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you for giving us the chance to kind of tell you a little bit about who we are. Anytime. And, and it's cool meeting you guys. So. Yeah, definitely. Well, I'm sure you got some cool projects and especially as you expand into some of the truck stuff, uh, you know, let us know because we got, we got some things we can do. That's for sure. So good to have you guys involved. So. Yeah, for sure. That's awesome. Guys, thanks so much. Appreciate it. And uh, we'll be in touch soon. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Take care. Yeah. So let's, uh,